Hello, my name is Frank Westland from Karma Analytics and I will now give a short presentation of our approach for modeling batch processes or in general any process that uh, is depending on time. So the agenda will be a short introduction, then we will introduce the batch modeling in relative time, a couple of case studies and some conclusions. So batch processes um, are uh, one of several type of processes that we encounter in industry. Uh, we have continuous processes and also we have semi-batch processes. And they are quite common in uh, pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industries, food and beverage, chemical industries, and so on. And some examples are fermentation, drying, mixing, chemical reactions, uh, tablet coating. And uh, the modeling uh, batch processes uh, is important for uh, process development, also by help of design experiments, and also to understand the process as such. For example, uh, are the batches similar? And can I find the reason why the product quality lies outside the specifications for some batches? And are there any effects uh, from raw materials or season operator equipment? Some examples are given here. Uh, brewing, uh, chemicals, baking, biomanufacturing and food production. If we look at the whole process, um, it might consist of various steps, starting from raw material. And then we have some continuous processes, maybe a batch processes, and we have uh, univariate sensors and typically also a lot of implementations uh, are also done with the multi channel instruments, such as um, spectroscopy. And then at the end, we have the uh, final quality of our products. So if you look at a single batch, it is then a two-dimensional table, but for multiple batches we have three dimensions, we have batch, we have process variables and we have time. So how do we analyze this data? We can in principle also analyze the data directly with three-way methods, however, we typically unfold in two various ways. The one is to unfold so that we have for each row a batch and then combinations of the variables and samples or points of time as columns. Um, however, if the length of the batches is not the same, then we cannot necessarily compare like column 63 uh, across the batches because it will not be in the same state of the process. The other option here is to unfold so that we have J variables as columns and we have as many rows as we have batches and points of time or samples. It's important before we start to perform any modeling that we are aware of what kind of variables do we have in the process. Typically, we have some that are controlled. That could be temperature controlled to 37 degrees, and then we also observe temperature, which could be 37.3. And we can also observe other variables that for the, uh, the batch case, uh, is reflecting the change like in chemistry or biology. And then there's some variables that we like uh, didn't measure, some sensors we didn't put in our uh, system and some thing that we don't know. And then we have all the various sources of variation, raw material, uh, sample origin, we have uh, like time or we have uh, for example, uh, the equipment used, so maybe we have four chemical reactors running in parallel. Um, 
And still, with all these sources of variation, some known, some not known, we want the state of the process to be the same, either qualitatively or in a quantitative fashion. Here is a small example where we have some 10 variables for three batches, and we see that some are constant, some uh, are changing over the duration of the batch, and some are partially constant, and also we see the batches have various lengths. We have various approaches for modeling such data. One is an endpoint model where we say, okay, we are not so concerned how we get to the endpoint because we know, for example, we can always uh, dry like um, uh, a substance to 2% moisture. So then we establish a model for the like 2% moisture plus minus 0.5% maybe for a number of batches. And then we can monitor when are we coming into um, this state of the process. We can also compare the trajectories of the batches qualitatively um, and see that the batches, they seem to be behaving in the same way. Another option is uh, moving block models where we they want to mix things, become uh, homogeneous, and then we are monitoring the, uh, the change uh, over time, like for two moving windows, and we stop when we see that the mixture has become homogeneous. We can also directly make predictions with quantitative models. So we have like a spectrometer inside the, the vessel or on the, uh, on the side of the vessel, like through a sapphire window, and we can predict like the API concentration. Or the final option is to go for like the full-fledged system that is to have dynamic and multivariate control charts. So we can follow individual variables, we have multivariate control limits, and we have outlier statistics. We will discriminate between distance inside the model to the model mean, and also the residual distance. So what is the procedure? First, we collect data for several batches. And some of them might be faulty batches. That means they are not inside the spec for the final product. But most of them will be what we call golden batches. So analyze them and we can look for outliers. And if we have outliers, take them out with a good gut feeling. And then we establish that model and we will also verify that we can detect uh, the anomalies that we see in some of the batches outside spec. And we store this model for using it online. So then in step two, we follow new batches over time, detect out the control situations, and we find the cause by looking in various plots interactively for example, the residuals and the contribution plots. And then you might take actions either with an automatic control system or um, by uh, operator or supervisor of the process. So now introducing the concept of relative time. So assume that we want to heat water till a boiling point and we are in various locations. So we have water starting at 35 degrees, 27 and 20, and also we have snow. So now if we look at the curves for, for heating these samples, we see that we cannot analyze them just from sample number. Okay, so this is uh, an extreme example just to illustrate um, <coughs> the concept. But this also applies then in other cases where um, the batches don't start in the same chemical or biological state. So the only thing we can do here if we want to analyze these four curves is to represent them from the common start and common end point. 
So it means that we cannot start to model this data until all the samples have been heated up to 35 degrees. What are the challenges when analyzing uh, the batch data? One to the left is that they have a uh, unique, uh, unique length, which is uh, more common than uncommon. And for chemical reaction, as we see also on the right here, you see that the lengths are very different. But if we look at the endpoint, um, the reactions have actually come to the same chemical state, just that like one is lasting 20 hours and one is lasting five hours. We might also have phase transitions and nonlinear behavior, like for fermentation, where we here have three variables and we see various phases. And these phases, they don't change based on the sample number of time. They change based on the biological state because bacteria behave quite differently across the batches. We also have typically various set points across the batches. Some variables can be partially constant, I see into the right. So to summarize the challenges, it's not always feasible to control the starting point of a batch process. And the progress must uh, not necessarily be linear over time. In most cases, it is not. And also the batch lengths will not be the same. So how do we cope with this? Well, our solution is to model this in relative time. So it's independent of the process time. And also, you can visualize the state of the process independently of sampling rate. So let's say you're developing your process in a, a pilot plant, and then you sample every five minutes. In the production stage, you sample every 10 minutes. This is no problem for our approach, because we look at the present state of the process regardless of the sampling rate. We can also plot the individual variables in relative time. It is a very strong concept. However, although we say that this is approach is like free of any assumptions regarding batch length and things like that, we recommend to use the variables that are actually reflecting the change in the process for the, the, these models and not variables that are kept constant or changed in steps. Because this will just sort of uh, confuse the model when uh, some variables are going back and forth, uh, like temperature is controlled, plus minus some disturbance. If we have sensors like spectroscopy, the good thing is that these sensors, they will reflect the chemical biological state directly. So a kind of a calibration free approach and we don't need to worry if variables are kept constant or not. We believe that this approach is particularly advantageous in the monitoring phase because as I mentioned, it's independent of sampling rate, actually also in what state that you're starting. So it's a, you're starting to collect data before you have actually started the reaction. But it doesn't matter, then we just see that the process has not changed in a chemical sense. And we show this progress in relative time always, from 0 to 100. And also we can handle nonlinear behavior. So we monitor the batch over time in the multivariate space, detect out of spec situations with different diagnostics, and then we take some action. coming to outlier detection in multivariate batch models. In static models, we use statistics that are like static. So there is one critical like distance limit for a continuous process. But in this case, we are monitoring the limits as 
I they change uh, 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 over the batch duration. Okay, not to the mean of the model, but always in relation to tip to where are we on the trajectory in the batch process. So one example here, a chemical reaction. We have in this case only three process variables, two temperatures and a pressure. We have four batches. This is for simplicity. And then we project one new batch. I assume that many of you are familiar with uh, multivariate methods such as crystal component analysis. Um, so this is the basis for uh, that first model. And if we look at the raw data for temperature B, we see that the batch lengths are not the same. So the question is, so how can we now model this data when it looks like this? A lot of people, they will now try to do some time warping to make these curves be similar. But in our opinion, this is not the correct way to go around this type of data and it's not needed. So if you now look at the uh, score space from a PCN model to the left here, on what we say are the golden batches, we also see that in on the right hand side that there is like a equilibrium point. So the, the reaction is sort of going a bit back and forth before it takes on. So the start is lower left and it ends up on, on the middle here. Then we can estimate the trajectories with uncertainties uh, with our approach as shown in the two other figures here. And we can put confidence limits. And we see that these will change over time because the variation along the trajectory is not identical for the whole duration. So now when we monitor a new batch, we are merely projecting it onto this model and we see that we started here to collect data earlier than when we actually established that model. But that doesn't matter. As soon as we reach the same starting point, we will enter the start of the trajectory here to the lower left. We see also that for some point of time, the batch was outside of the limit. And we can also represent this directly as a trajectory model distance in one dimension. So people don't need to know actually what is PCA. We can represent it as a one dimensional limit and relative time on the X axis. We can also click on one of these points and we see in the contribution plot, which variables that have changed. A second example, Fermentation, a bit more complex. This is a data set that has been used a lot for different batch modeling approaches. So this is a simulated data set with a mechanistic model um, for production of penicillin. And I have chosen 10 batches for the model and then three for projection. And two of those that I project, they have deliberately being altered so that they should not follow the trajectory of, of the 10 normal batches. So we have 10 variables here that are collected then on an hourly basis in this simulation and our end product quality is biomass. So now if you look at some of the data, just the raw data, here we have ethanol concentration and we see that the batches have various lengths and also that the differences are are quite huge uh, here on the sample number axis or, or like the process time axis. If you look at specific oxygen uptake, we see also variations here over the batches, but not in the same way as for ethanol. So um, we think that it's not a good idea now to try to time warp individual variables because it will actually uh, change the uh, collation structure that we actually have in the data. Now, if we look at the pattern of all the variables in this case, 
and you saw this in collation loadings, which is nice because then we don't have to think of, of the scaling in the plot. Uh, we, we see the correlations directly. That means also the expand variance for the variables, which is then presented here um, as correlation and correlation square is explained variance. So now if we look at the progression over time, we see how the um, batch progresses starting here at the lower right. And we estimate the trajectory and confidence intervals. And now if we project new samples onto this model, new batches, we see this. So we also saw in the previous plot that all these changes over sample number that we saw for the variables, and actually it was very different also from the other eight variables. It doesn't influence the model at all because this is now in biological time. Right. So now we see that the blue one, which is normal, follows the trajectory with inside the limits and the two others that on purpose were sort of altered um, in the simulation. They are outside, but note only for some part of the trajectory. So after we come to like 60 percent on uh, in progression, these, these two are also falling into the normal situation. Which is kind of interesting because no one has really observed this before. So to conclude, which method to use depends on the type of process and need for details in following the batch progression. And we need to group the variables into what roles they have in the process. And we see that most yield processes have variations due to raw materials, equipment, which will influence the setting of the control variables, as well as their duration. And we often need several models if we have distinct phases in the process and between different steps in the process. And if we use microscopic techniques, we see directly the chemistry biology. Uh, so this is then a very nice way to follow the chemical biological state of the process. Again, independent of the sampling rate. So we model these batch processes in relative time. So we don't need to force the batches to a common length or to warp individual variables which we don't think is a good idea anyway. Or to say that we introduce a maturity index like from 1 to 100 because the relative time gives this maturity directly. And we also think that this has a specific advantage when we monitor new batches because we don't need to synchronize like the starting point and also note as the batch is progressing. And we can represent these dynamic limits at confidence intervals in a one-dimensional representation. So there is no need for people like you to know anything about the underlying method as such. And uh, once we have these relative times, then we can also model data, uh, what we call the batch level where we have the product quality as our response variables. And there will be a tutorial coming up in not too distant future, presenting how we can do that. Also then using the concept of relative time. So this was a short introduction to our modeling approach for batch data. So um, I wish you all the best for your models and uh, see you soon.